Thank you. Please be seated. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Arias had intended to present the testimony of Patricia Womack. Ms. Womack was supposed to testify regarding the abusive environment environment Ms. Arias grew up in as well as the abuse she suffered as an adult. Ms. Womack is unavailable to testify. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendant will now speak to you. This statement is not made under oath and is not subject to cross-examination. Ms. Arias, you may proceed. Please wait to begin. One of the jurors needs to have a new headset. You may proceed. Yeah. <clears throat> Some months back, while the first phase of this trial was ongoing, my mom visited me just like she'd been doing every week since trial began. She told me that after leaving the courthouse, she was idling at a stoplight and she happened to look over at the car next to her. And Travis's siblings were in that car. My mom and I were silent for a few moments when she finally voiced exactly what I was thinking. She said, I know they're going through hell. Yet nothing drove that point home for me more than when I heard them speak last week. I never meant to cause them so much pain. When Stephen said he read on Travis's 3x5 card that it said, call Stephen, and that he never got that call, I know that's because of me. And when Samantha showed us the last picture that she took with Travis, I know it's because of me that that will always be the last picture that she'll ever take with Travis. Throughout this trial, I've avoided looking at Travis's family for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. But I've wondered, where is his grandma? Is she here? I didn't learn until last week what happened to her. Samantha said that Travis was the glue to their family. Around Thanksgiving last, not last year, in 2007, Travis called me. He was really upset. He said his grandmother was ill and frail and that he didn't know if she was going to make it. He said he didn't know what his family would do if she didn't make it because she was the glue to their family. To know now that both are gone and that I may have also inadvertently induced her passing destroys me. Okay. 
Every time I've had the thought or desire to commit suicide, there's one element that has always, almost always caused me to waver. They're sitting right over there. They're my family. At times, I've lost track of that element. For example, the incident I testified to when I took my razor apart at the Siskiyou County Jail. I managed to convince myself that they would get over the pain with time and that in the long run, I was doing them a favor by unburdening them of my presence in their lives. I wrote a bunch of them goodbye letters addressed specifically to each person. And in the letters, I didn't focus so much on explanations, but on how much and why I loved each of them. <laughs> then I wrote a general explanatory letter to help them understand my decision. At that time, I saw it as taking myself off of life support. I didn't know a lot of anything about prison at that time. And I didn't think it was fair to expect my family to have to support me for the rest of my life. I didn't know then that if I got life instead of death, I could become employed and self-reliant. I didn't know that if I got life, there are many things I can do to affect positive change and contribute in a meaningful way. In prison, there are programs I can start and people I can help and programs that I can continue to participate in. I'll share a few examples that I thought of. A few months before trial, and by that I mean jury selection, my hair was past my waist, and I donated it to Locks of Love, the nonprofit which creates wigs for cancer patients who've lost their hair. In fact, that was my third donation to that organization since I was arrested. If I'm allowed to live in prison, I will continue to donate to that organization for the rest of my life. Over the years I've spent in incarceration, I've received many requests from women to teach them Spanish or American Sign Language. Because my case was pending, I just didn't have the time. In prison, I will. If I'm sentenced to life, I will live among the general population of women, and I'll be able to share my knowledge of those subjects with them, the ones who have the desire to learn also. I may even be able to start classes. If I get permission, I'd like to implement a recycling program. The women's prison in Goodyear houses thousands of women, and each week, huge loads of waste are hauled off to a landfill. A substantial portion of that could be kept out of landfill and recycled instead. It may even create new jobs for the people there. This is one small thing that could have a far-reaching and positive impact on the community and on the planet. There's a higher rate of illiteracy in prison than in everyday society. I know that reading has enriched my life by expanding my knowledge base and opening my eyes to new worlds and different cultures. I can help other women become literate so that they too can add that dimension to their lives. Along the lines of literacy, I'd like to start a book club or a reading group, something that brings people together in a positive and constructive way so that we can share and recommend other good books and stimulate discussions of a higher nature. Additionally, I've designed a t-shirt. This is the t-shirt. Um, of which 100% of the proceeds go to support nonprofit organizations which also assist other victims of domestic violence. Some people may not believe that I am a survivor of domestic violence. They're entitled to their opinion. I'm supporting this cause because it's very, very important to me. These are only a handful of examples. I've never been to prison. I don't know from personal experience what it's like there. But I'm certain that after I arrive, I'll likely find many other ways in which I can contribute to the women there. I'd like to share with you now a few things about me and a few things about my family. When I was little, took a lot of pictures of me. I'm her first child. She almost, she, she had her camera everywhere and she could take a lot of pictures of me when I was first born. Salinas is near the coast and so it seemed a lot of overcast days, but when it was sunny, she would take me out to the backyard and turn on the sprinkler so I could play. That's me attempting to dress myself. 
few years later, um, Carl came along, my little brother, and we became inseparable. When we were little, my parents took us everywhere, including SeaWorld here and Hawaii. But my fondest memories with him are of us goofing off at home on a lazy Saturday, just making a mess of the living room in our pajamas. When I was 11 years old, and the slide is backward, I apologize. When I was 11 years old, my little sister, Angela, was born four weeks early. I think Carl's blinking here. I was so excited to have a baby sister. I watched my mom's stomach grow. I watched Angela come into this world. And after the doctor swaddled her, he turned to me and said to my mom and said, do you want to hold her first? These are very useful pictures. And on occasion, my family and I would get together for family portraits, such as these. In ninth grade, my family and I moved back to Wairika, but I still went back to Santa Maria periodically to visit friends. This is Patty. She was my best friend for years. She was here last week to testify on my behalf, as you heard Mr. Nermi tell you in opening statements. But she didn't return today because she and her nine-year-old daughter were threatened and harassed if she came back to the state. I'm 21 years old here. After I moved out of my parents' house at age 17, my relationship with my dad improved a little. This is my grandma and her twins. My aunt is on the left and my mom is on the right. These are my parents when they were just a little bit younger. This is Bobby and I. It's a little out of order chronologically. We're hanging out in our dirty little rundown house in Montague that I had mentioned previously. At times we lived there without power and phone. The winters were freezing. We could see our breath inside the house. My parents did not support this relationship. And we were young and just trying to figure out life on our own. When this picture, when I see this picture, I'm reminded of that quote by Charles Dickens when he says they were the best of times, they were the worst of times. We're smiling here in this picture to me exemplifies that. It was a difficult relationship, but Bobby will always, always be special to me. I'm 21 here. This is a photo of Matt McCarty and I, taken a few months after we broke up, a few months after he moved down to Big Sur where I was working at Bintana. As you know, we remain friends, and on this day, we utilize the Thomas Company passes to tour the Monterey Bay Aquarium. <coughs> Daryl and I began seeing each other a little over a year after that. In this photo, I'm coming out of a redheaded stage that I went through for a few years. This is one of my favorite pictures of Daryl and me. We were at Chivo's, a restaurant in Monterey, uh, where our friend Tony and his band were playing uh, blues and reggae live. He dedicated songs to us, and we danced. There was a big answer. When we began dating, we started a yearly tradition in which we'd go camping every summer at this remote little campground. It's called Kirk Creek. It's south of Big Sur in an area that the locals call the South Coast. This is Daryl, Jack, and I at Montana. It's hard to see in this photo, but the ocean is in the background. It's on the terrace. After we bought our house in Palm Desert, we sought out some snow in the nearby mountains that first winter. We settled in and made a little life for ourselves for that spend of time. Jack was always with us on the weekends. He took that picture of me. I made friends with my coworkers, and sometimes we'd go out after a shift just to chill and hang out. Daryl and Jack and I did a lot of things together. Here we rode the aerial tram in Palm Springs to the top of the San Jacinto Mountains. Daryl's ex-wife took this picture. We were all at Chuck E. Cheese's celebrating Jack's seventh birthday. Jack and I bonded. He's a great kid. I haven't seen him since June 3rd, 2008. I hear he's much bigger now, taller than me. My family and I still got together periodically for group portraits. These were taken at a party in Maria. In 2010, my little sister gave birth to this beautiful little girl on the right. 
The tiny premature baby that I witnessed come into this world now has a baby of her own. She's a mature, responsible, dedicated mother. She's also engaged to a wonderful man. And his daughter, this gorgeous girl on the left, is my niece's new big sister. I've met these girls only through a thick pane of glass. They get along like they've always known each other. I won't be at my sister's wedding when she ties the knot next year. And I won't be at, I won't be her wedding photographer like we had always talked about. The same is true for my brother Carl. The boy I grew up with became a family man. He and his wife married in 2010. I wasn't there to celebrate with them, and I wasn't there to take their pictures, and I have no one to blame but myself. A few weeks before trial, they welcomed this precious little baby into the world. I haven't met her yet. Until a few weeks ago, I had huge hopes of becoming a part of these girls' lives someday. My nieces are the closest I'll ever come to motherhood, because I'm not going to have children of my own. I'm not going to become a mother because of my own terrible choices. I've had to lay that dream to rest. You've heard before that I'm an artist. As it now stands, I'll never create another oil painting. But these are some of my drawings. I'm pretty good with hands and nature. My best with portraits. There's Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, Elizabeth Taylor. This picture is a little distorted. This is my niece when she was a bit younger, playing the piano, while attempting to play the piano. My family and I have a lot of memories, especially ones like this at Christmas. We won't be creating any more of these kinds of memories together. This is how I used to spend the holidays with my family. It was Carl's idea to hold my portrait in this Christmas family photo taken a few years ago. My parents were there, my siblings were there, my brother's wife was there. From now on, this is how my family is going to spend the holidays with me. Following my arrest, I wanted so much to avoid trial. Not necessarily the outcome, although that's naturally not something I was looking forward to but trial. All of the graphic, mortifying, horrific details paraded out into a public arena. Instead, I was hoping to go quietly into the night, whether off to prison or the next life. But with the amount of attention my case received early on, I felt in my ignorance that it was necessary to speak out. I got on TV and I lied. I lied about what I did, and I lied about the nature of my relationship with Travis. It's never been my intention to malign his name or character. In fact, it was a goal of mine to preserve his reputation. I didn't want to drag out Travis's skeletons or mine and explain my experiences with them. I didn't want to unveil all of those ugly text messages and emails and that awful tape. All these things which now stand as a public and permanent testimony of the darker aspects of our relationship. To 18 strangers, in front of Travis's family, in front of my family, in front of what feels like the whole world. It's never been my intention to throw mud on Travis's name. When I took the stand, I was obligated to answer the questions posed to me. And if you'll remember, many times I was quick to defend him in the same breath. I loved Travis, and I looked up to him. At one point, he was the world to me. This is the worst mistake of my life. It's the worst thing I've ever done. It's the worst thing I ever could have seen myself doing. In fact, I couldn't have seen myself doing it. <clears throat> Before that day, I wouldn't even want to harm a spider. I'd gather them up in cups and put them outside. To this day, I can hardly believe I was capable of such violence, but I know that I was. And for that, I'm gonna be sorry for the rest of my life. Probably longer. I was horrified by what I'd done, and I'm horrified still. In many ways, my family has also suffered a great loss. Their pain is fresh because they only learned about it two weeks ago, the moment the verdict was read. 
the moment their hopes of ever welcoming me home someday were dashed. My dad, who's here today, was in California, awaiting anxiously in front of the TV. My mom came to visit me after court that dark day. She had spoken to my dad on the way over, and she told me that in the 34 years that they've been together, she's never heard him cry the way he did that day. I've caused that pain. I've caused them to hurt that way. And I will concede that with Travis's family, theirs is a much greater loss, and I can never make up for it. It's my hope that with the verdict you've rendered thus far, that they will finally gain a sense of closure. Stephen said he doesn't want to look at his brother's murderer anymore. If I get life, he won't have to. I've made many public statements that I would prefer the death penalty to life in prison. Each time I said that, though I meant it, I lacked perspective. Until very recently, I could not have imagined standing before you all and asking you to give me life. To me, life in prison was the most unappealing outcome I could possibly think of. I thought I'd rather die. But as I stand here now, I can't in good conscience ask you to sentence me to death because of them. Asking for death is tantamount to suicide. Either way, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. It'll either be shortened or not. If it's shortened, the people who will hurt the most are my family. I'm asking you, please, please don't do that to them. I've already hurt them so badly, along with so many other people. I want everyone's healing to begin, and I want everyone's pain to stop. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please go back to the jury room for approximately five minutes. Please remember the admonition. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Please be seated. Counsel, please approach. The jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, the bailiff is going to give each of you a copy of the final jury instructions for the penalty phase. Again, this is your copy. Feel free to make any notes you would like on your copy. Your copy will be shredded at the end of the trial. I am going to read these instructions to you. I invite you to read along with me beginning on page two. Members of the jury, at this phase of the sentencing hearing, you will determine whether the defendant will be sentenced to life imprisonment or death. The law that applies is stated in these instructions, and it is your duty to follow all of them, whether you agree with them or not. You must not single out certain instructions and disregard others. You must not be influenced at any point in these proceedings by conjecture, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. You are not to be swayed by mere sympathy not related to the evidence presented during the penalty phase. You must not be influenced by your personal feelings of bias or prejudice for or against the defendant or any person involved in this case on the basis of anyone's race, color, religion, national ancestry, gender, or sexual orientation. Both the state and the defendant have a right to expect that you will consider all the evidence, follow the law, exercise your discretion conscientiously, and reach a just verdict. 
I do not mean to indicate any opinion on the evidence or what your verdict should be by any ruling or remark that I have made or may make during this penalty phase. I am not allowed to express my feelings in this case, and if I have shown any, you must disregard them. You and you alone are the triers of fact. As jurors, you have a duty to discuss the case with one another and to deliberate in an effort to reach a just verdict. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but only after you consider the evidence impartially with your fellow jurors. During your deliberations, you should not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if you become convinced that it is wrong. However, you should not change your honest belief concerning the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinions of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. You are to apply the law to the evidence and this way decide whether the defendant will be sentenced to life imprisonment or death. The evidence you shall consider consists of the testimony and exhibits the court admitted in evidence during all of the three phases of this trial. It is the duty of the court to rule on the admissibility of evidence. You shall not concern yourselves with the reasons for these rulings. You shall disregard questions and exhibits that were withdrawn or to which objections were sustained. Evidence that was admitted for a limited purpose shall not be considered for any other purpose. You shall disregard testimony and exhibits that the court has not admitted or the court has stricken. The lawyers may stipulate certain facts exist. This means both sides agree that evidence exists and is to be considered by you during your deliberations at the conclusion of the trial. You are to treat a stipulation as any other evidence. You are free to accept it or reject it, in whole or in part, just as any other evidence. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is the testimony of a witness who saw, heard, or otherwise observed an event. Circumstantial evidence is the proof of a fact or facts from which you may find another fact. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. It is for you to determine the importance to be given to the evidence, regardless of whether it is direct or circumstantial. During the aggravation phase of the trial, you found that the state had proved that a statutory aggravating circumstance exists, making the defendant eligible for the death sentence. During this penalty phase, the defendant and the state may present any evidence that is relevant to the determination of whether there is mitigation that is sufficiently substantial to call for a sentence less than death. The state may also present any evidence that demonstrates that the defendant should not be shown leniency. Leniency means a sentence less than death. Mitigating circumstances may be found from any evidence presented during any of the phases of the trial. You should consider all of the evidence without regard to which party presented it. Each party is entitled to consideration of the evidence, whether produced by that party or by another party. You are the sole judges of the credibility of the witnesses and what weight is to be given the testimony of each witness. In considering the testimony of each witness, you may take into account the opportunity and ability of the witness to observe, the witness's memory and manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, the reasonableness of the testimony of the witness considered in light of all the evidence, and any other factors that bear on credibility and weight. A witness qualified as an expert by education or experience may state opinions on matters in that witness's field of expertise and may also state reasons for those opinions. Expert opinion testimony should be ju judged just as any other testimony. You are not bound by it. You may accept it or reject it in whole or in part, and you should give it as much credibility and weight as you think it deserves considering the witness's qualifications and experience, the reasons given for the opinions, and all the other evidence in the case. The testimony of a law enforcement officer is not entitled to any greater or lesser importance or believability merely because of the fact that the witness is a law enforcement officer. You are to consider the testimony of a police officer just as you would the testimony of any other witness. The attorney's remarks, statements, and arguments are not evidence, but are intended to help you understand the evidence and apply the law. The attorneys are entitled to make any objections that they deem appropriate. These objections should not influence you, and you should make no assumptions because of objections by the attorneys. Relatives of the victims made statements relating to personal characteristics and uniqueness of the victims and impact of the murder on the victim's family. You may consider this information to the extent that it rebuts mitigation. You may not consider the information as a new aggravating circumstance. 
Mitigating circumstances are any factors that are a basis for a life sentence instead of a death sentence, so long as they relate to any sympathetic or other aspect of the defendant's character, propensity, history or record, or circumstances of the offense. Mitigating circumstances are not an excuse or justification for the offense, but are factors that, in fairness or mercy, may reduce the defendant's moral culpability. Mitigating circumstances may be offered by the defendant or state or be apparent from the evidence presented at any phase of these proceedings. You are not required to find that there is a connection between a mitigating circumstance and the crime committed in order to consider the mitigation evidence. Any connection or lack of connection may impact the quality and strength of the mitigation evidence. You must disregard any jury instruction given to you at any other phase of the trial that conflicts with this principle. The fact that the defendant has been convicted of first-degree murder is unrelated to the existence of mitigating circumstances. You must give independent consideration to all of the evidence concerning mitigating circumstances despite the conviction. The circumstances proposed as mitigation by the defendant for your consideration in this case are, one, defendant was 27 years old at the time of the offense. Two, defendant has no prior criminal history. Three, defendant was a good friend. Four, defendant lacked support from her family. Five, defendant suffered abuse and neglect as a child and as an adult. Six, defendant tried to make the best of her life. Seven, defendant consistently tried to improve herself. Eight, defendant is a talented artist. You are not limited to these proposed mitigating circumstances in considering the appropriate sentence. You also may consider anything related to the defendant's character, propensity, history or record, or circumstances of the offense. The defendant is not required to testify or make any statement, and you are precluded from drawing an inference against her should she decide not to testify or make a statement. The decision on whether or not to testify or make a statement is left to the defendant, acting with the advice of her attorneys. You must not let this choice affect your deliberations in any way. The state may submit evidence to rebut mitigation evidence. You may individually consider rebuttal evidence in determining the existence of a mitigating circumstance or in assessing the significant significance of that mitigating evidence. You shall not consider rebuttal evidence as aggravation. You must decide the appropriate sentence based on the facts of the case and by applying these jury instructions. You must not consider the financial cost of any possible punishment when deciding whether to sentence the defendant to life in prison or death. While all 12 of you had to unanimously agree that the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of a statutory aggravating circumstance, you do not need to unanimously agree on a particular mitigating circumstance. Each one of you must decide individually whether any mitigating circumstance exists. You are not limited to the mitigating circumstances offered by the defendant. You must also consider any other information that you find is relevant in determining whether to impose a life sentence, so long as it relates to an aspect of the defendant's background, character, propensities, record, or circumstances of the offense. The defendant bears the burden of proving the existence of any mitigating circumstance that the defendant offers by a preponderance of the evidence. That is, although the defendant need not prove its existence beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant must convince you by the evidence presented that it is more probably true than not true that such a mitigating circumstance exists. In proving a mitigating circumstance, the defendant may rely on any evidence already presented and is not required to present additional evidence. You individually determine whether mitigation exists. In light of the aggravating circumstances you have found, you must then individually determine if the total of the mitigation is sufficiently substantial to call for leniency. Sufficiently substantial to call for leniency means that mitigation must be of such quality or value that it is adequate in the opinion of an individual juror to persuade that juror to vote for a sentence of life in prison. Even if a juror believes that the aggravating and mitigating circumstances are of the same quality or value, that juror is not required to vote for a sentence of death and may instead vote for a sentence of life in prison. A juror may find mitigation and impose a life sentence even if the defendant does not present any mitigation evidence. 
a mitigating factor that motivates one juror to vote for a sentence of life in prison may be evaluated by another juror as not having been proved or if proved as not significant to the assessment of the appropriate penalty. In other words, each of you must determine whether, in your individual assessment, the mitigation is of such quality or value that it warrants leniency in this case. The law does not presume what is the appropriate sentence. The defendant does not have the burden of proving that life is the appropriate sentence. The state does not have the burden of proving that death is the appropriate sentence. It is for you, as jurors, to decide what you individually believe is the appropriate sentence. In reaching a reasoned moral judgment about which sentence is justified and appropriate, you must decide how compelling or persuasive the totality of the mitigating factors is when compared against the totality of the aggravating factors and the facts and circumstances of the case. This assessment is not a mathematical one, but instead must be made in light of each juror's individual, qualitative evaluation of the facts of the case, the severity of the aggravating factor, and the quality of the mitigating factors found by each juror. If you unanimously agree there is mitigation sufficiently substantial to call for leniency, then you shall return a verdict of life. If you unanimously agree there is no mitigation, or the mitigation is not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency, then you shall return a verdict of death. Your decision is not a recommendation. Your decision is binding. If you unanimously find that the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment, your foreperson shall sign the verdict form indicating your decision. If you unanimously find that the defendant should be sentenced to death, your foreperson shall sign the verdict form indicating your decision. If you cannot unanimously agree on the appropriate sentence, your foreperson shall tell the judge. I will read the rest of the instructions to you after the attorneys have completed their arguments. Because of the hour, we are going to take an early lunch recess. I'm going to ask that you all return at 1.15. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Counsel, is there anything else before the recess? No, thank you. No, Your Honor. We are at recess.